You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least two bonus episodes a month and a monthly advanced read and pre-publication author chat. For those on Facebook, I host a special Patreon Facebook group where we all chat books. Thanks so much to those who already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, I am chatting with Joy Calloway about The Grand Design. Joy is the international best-selling author of The Grand Design, Secret Sisters, and the Fifth Avenue Artist Society. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with her husband and her two children. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Joy. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Cindy? I am also doing great, and I'm really looking forward to talking about the grand design. Thank you so much. It's, I'm so thrilled about this book, so I cannot wait to discuss it. Good. Well, before we really dive into the questions, why don't you just give me a quick synopsis of The Grand Design for those that won't have read it yet? Sure, of course. So The Grand Design is set at the Greenbrier Resort in both 1908 and 1946, and it centers on Dorothy Draper about how the Greenbrier Resort and the love she found there as a young woman influenced her bold shift from New York iron heiress to world-renowned decorator. So how did you first learn about Dorothy Draper and her decorating the Greenbrier Resort? You know, I've been going to the Greenbrier since I was a little kid. My family, I was doing ancestry. I'm a very big fan of ancestry and realized that my family has been in West Virginia, obviously Virginia prior, for about eight generations. So I honestly can't remember a time where I wasn't aware of Dorothy Draper and the Greenbrier. My grandfather actually, during college, lived right up the hill from the Greenbrier and helped install a fire alarm system on one of his summers away from Duke. And that summer actually was the same summer that Dorothy Draper was redecorating the hotel. It sounded like from your author note, and this will not be a spoiler at all, <laughs> that she continued to redecorate. So she did the big redecoration that when the hotel reopened after World War II that your book focuses on. But then it sounds like over the years she came back and after she was gone, her company came back and continued to do updates. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think they have now one of the longest standing partnerships in the interior design sphere because they still are decorating and updating the Greenbrier. The Dorothy Draper Company is under the the advisement of Carlton Varney, who is her is Dorothy Draper's successor and just the most remarkable person, such a visionary. So yes, absolutely. That has now been in a sixty about sixty year partnership between, you know, the Greenbrier and Dorothy Draper. And, you know, you really can't separate the two of them. Dorothy Draper and the Greenbrier kind of coexist together. And so it's really nice that they've kept it up. I knew about the Greenbrier, but I didn't know about Dorothy Draper or their relationship in terms of having that long-lasting decorating relationship and her ties to the Greenbrier. So I learned a ton when I read your book. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's interesting how sometimes, you know, places can be characters in a way and how those places could kind of interact with real life characters and kind of solidify 
key points in your life. And that's just definitely what happened with Dorothy Draper. So it's kind of neat to talk about kind of her legacy there and just how it kind of, it just shaped who she became. Absolutely. And how did you decide to actually write about her? Well, I first, as I was, we were all there, actually, we go on a family trip to the Greenbrier once a year. And we were um, on one of our annual trips. It's actually both sides of my family. They come and we have this big family reunion there, usually in the winter. And I was thinking about, okay, what book do I want to write next? (laughs) You know, and thinking about just my various options. And as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, this is such a special place to me. I would love to write about it. And so I started to get into some conversations with the historian at the Greenbrier, Dr. Bob Conti, who had been there for 40 years and was just a wealth of knowledge. And as I was kind of pouring over the history of the Greenbrier and looking at the history is so rich, there are, there are a million stories that you could tell set there. But it started to occur to me as I was reading and kind of absorbing the, the spirit of the Greenbrier while I was there, I started to see that Dorothy Draper had to be the character to tell the story, that this, is, this place spoke of her as much as, it's, as much as she spoke of it. And I just knew right then that her story was an interesting one. One of the reasons that it, it fits so well, too, is because Dorothy as an iron heiress during the Gilded Age, that's the type of people that were making their way down to the Greenbrier kind of at the turn of the 20th century. So she was a perfect fit. Not only that, but it was the army hospital in the 40s. It had been completely disassembled. It was basically just the shell of, of the luxury resort it had once been. And kind of without her guidance and without her, without her celebrity, really, in a lot of ways, because she was truly kind of the Martha Stewart of her day, knew everyone and was very well regarded, uh, had a long standing article and column in Good Housekeeping. So she was kind of just a household name and brought kind of that star power, as well as her amazing designs to the Greenbrier in order to kind of revamp it back into the luxury resort. She had remembered it from being a a young woman. That was the part that I thought was so interesting that it had been used as a hospital during the war and that then she had to try to, from the ground up, remodel it. Yes. And it was a huge, huge undertaking, probably the largest. But prior to doing this, she had actually done a, redone a very large, well, it was, this is a, a new build, I guess, in Brazil that I'm speaking of, but she'd done a huge hotel in Brazil prior to this, but that had its issues and actually never really opened officially. And then so when she's tasked with the Greenbrier and she knows that this is the largest project of her career, it it was a massive undertaking. And when she finally gets there, she, she realizes how much it's going to take because the place, like I said, was completely disassembled and just changed into like bare bones. And so she she had an opportunity in a way, it was a blank slate. At the same time, there was a lot of work to be done. And she was a tremendous visionary and such a wonderful creative. So for her, I I like to think that it was a challenge, but it was also just the highlight of her career as well. I lived in Rio when I was young. So when I was first reading about how she'd had this huge project there, I was racking my brain trying to figure out where it was and what it was. And then I realized eventually that it had never opened, but I couldn't quite envision where it had been. But that was fascinating to me that she worked down there. Yes, it was interesting. It was right around the time of World War II. And it was before Brazil kind of took a, before things were kind of sketchy in Brazil, I guess you could say, surrounding the war. So the war kind of put a stop to, to that project, that, and they outlawed gambling. And, and that resort was um, one of the big money makers of that resort was supposed to be its casinos. So that was just, just put a damper completely on that project. But I want to say that they still, that the, the building is still standing today and still has some of her designs in it. So I think that'd be really fun to go down and visit sometime. Absolutely, to see what it looks like. Well, tell me about your research. It sounds like they have a historian on their staff. Is that right, that you spoke to? I mean, that's his job, is working there as a historian? Yes, and actually, it's pretty remarkable. I think the only other historic hotel that I'm aware of in in our area that actually has another historian is the Grand in uh, Michigan. But it's pretty remarkable, and it speaks volumes to the fact that the Greenbrier really does value its its rich history and is working to preserve it. Dr. Bob Conti has written some incredible books on the Greenbrier's history, and they were such a great wealth of information. But also, he himself was just so open and willing to talk to me about any of the questions I had. And 
it was just a wonderful, uh, I couldn't have done it without him. I tell him that all the time that it was just such a great thing to be able to tap his, his like vast knowledge anytime I needed to. So that definitely for sure was a great basis for kind of getting the, the feel of the place, right? There were some, some facilities and, and buildings actually in the 1908 section that no longer exist. The most prominent one being that the Greenbrier actually had a different hotel standing at the time. The current hotel that's standing now was built in 1913. And so it was the old hotel actually was standing in tandem with it, but the old hotel didn't have air conditioning or heat. And so it was only a seasonal hotel. And they finally, as you know, tourism started surging in the area, they realized that this just wasn't possible and it wasn't, it wasn't worth kind of rehabbing. And so they tore that hotel down and the Greenbrier as it stands now was expanded. And so in 1908, she would have been obviously um, not familiar with that hotel of that she encounters in the forties. And so like little nuances like that and the timelines were really important for me to get right, as well as the culture of the people that were coming to the Greenbrier in 1908 and 1946 and, and what that looked like. Newspapers.com is a great resource too for historical fiction novelists or just really anyone interested in family history or even writing nonfiction. It's such a wealth of knowledge. You can look up anyone or any event from about 1800 to today. And it's just a, a such a valuable thing for me. And it was wonderful to look up basically every mention of Dorothy Draper from, from the time she was born through 1946. And then another wealth of information is Carlton Varney, who is Dorothy Draper's successor and current president of Dorothy Draper and Company. His books are very, very comprehensive on her life. Um, he's actually coming out with another, a new biography on her the exact same day as this book, which is really, really neat. He is the kindest, most amazing person ever. So I'm, I'm hoping people will use it actually as a companion to each other, that my novel and his biography will be something that book clubs can use on, in their discussions. So it's just been, thankfully, there was so much information on both the Greenbrier and Dorothy Draper to really inform the book and to make it as realistic as possible. I was just going to say, you need to pair those two together because nonfiction and fiction pairings are all the rage. So you need to make sure you capitalize on that. Absolutely. And he has just been the most amazing support for this book. I can't say enough about him as a person. And he totally exudes the Dorothy Draper brand of just color and and joy. His nickname is actually Mr. Color. So he's a great resource, though, too, for learning about her and just learning about like colorful design in general and how that you know design can really enliven people's spirits, which was Dorothy Draper's whole goal, really, was to enliven the spirits of people as they're visiting a place or if, if she was doing a, a condo or an apartment complex or a, even an airplane. She did those, too. Anywhere that she could um, kind of encourage people to have happy memories, that was something that she really, that was one of her missions and something she felt very strongly about as a person was just that people's surroundings can inform their, their emotions. And so he's just so great with that and and kind of continuing that legacy. So did you follow Dorothy's life closely or did you have to fill in gaps or how did that work for you? Well, there's a lot that's known. You know, when you look at someone, even your family, you will find kind of what I call the highlight reel, which is birth, maybe who they married, who their children were, what they did for a living, and then their death. And with Dorothy Draper, there's so much in that career section. But in her early life as well, I mean, there's a lot known about that. She was an heiress, as you know. She grew up in Tuxedo Park, New York. But there's, you know, not as much known about kind of her boarding life or who she may have been attached to and kind of like those things that aren't on the page as far as her connections with people, her friendships with, you know, who her friends were. But just those little things that you're never going to catch on, you know, a biography, for instance, just those, those instances that maybe bridge the gap between child and marriage. And so in the 1908 section, there's really the the specifics of her life are known. Obviously, she was grew up in Tuxedo Park, New York, along with the the Astors and Emily Post grew up there as well. It was kind of where everyone that prior to the Gilded Age, you know, you didn't want to be seen. You didn't want to be written about in the newspapers. That was kind of seen as cheap. If you were wealthy and you had a lot of money and you're an industrialist, you stayed out of the public eye as much as you could. And Tuxedo Park was a little kind of tucked away place where 
there are a, bun- a bunch of Fifth Avenue mansions, basically, in a little enclave up there. And then you find out she grew up there. And then she gets married to Dr. Um, George Draper, who went by Dan. And he was actually FDR's polio doctor. But between her childhood and her marriage, you know, like, like all of us, there's got to have been flirtations or there has to have been interesting things that kind of push you in one direction or, or another. And the thing that always interested me, the why that really solidified the plot of this book was, you know, during 1908, an heiress would never have, for instance, been a professional in any capacity. You were to be, you know, you were to get married to a fine person of similar standing. You were to be um, someone who ran the household, who ran the social schedule, but you were never to be a professional. And so it's interesting that she ended up going from heiress to CEO. That was a huge jump. And so I always I always have thought that something in her childhood, um, in those young adult years, kind of propelled her to make that move from, from heiress to CEO. And so that the summer at the Greenbrier kind of answers that question for me in the 1908 section. And I, I suppose that something that happened there that summer kind of put the bug in her ear that she was meant for something more than just a wife and social and, and doing her, doing the social scheduling that she was meant for. She was meant to expand on her gifts and to bring color into the world. I like that you write about that in your author's note, because I think people always want to know, okay, what really happened or what maybe was embellished or created or however you want to word it. So it was nice. And I really like that you had the language. Don't read this if you haven't read the book, because I don't <laughs> want to spoil anything. I thought that was great because some people do flip to the back immediately to start reading. So that's great to give a warning. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's so important because then I find that if I know ahead of time, the real story, I don't get as wrapped up in, in the narrative. And so I think it's really important to just my goal with writing historical fiction in general is to capture the spirit of the person. Yes, the events. And I try to stay as close to their real life as I can. But more importantly for me, it's that I want, my hope is that if they sat down and read the story about themselves, they would find that the spirit of the story matches theirs. And that's, that's my whole goal. I like that. That's a good way to look at it. What was the hardest part about writing the book? Hmm. You know, I guess it was trying to figure out fact and fiction in this. Again, there's so much information about about her and about her life and just trying to figure out how to best, you know, figure out what to drop in in fiction and how to how to stay true to who she was and her actual trajectory. But also, you know, it became very apparent to me early on that the Greenbrier was going to be a character in this book, not just a setting. And, you know, the way that this happens is I found that the Greenbrier itself was kind of interacting with her as a person and it kind of informing some of her decisions. And because of that, I was straddling the line between staying true to the Greenbrier's history and staying true to Dorothy's history. And so trying to find that balance um, and kind of leaning into Dorothy's history in some instances and kind of fictionalizing the Greenbrier's history and then doing the same thing. Uh, leading into the Greenbrier's history some and then fictionalizing Dorothy's uh, was important and needed in this story to kind of to create a compelling narrative. But that was a difficult thing to try to figure out, you know, how to lean into one thing and, and the freedom to feel the freedom to fictionalize some things in the other side of the narrative. To be able to just balance it all. Right. I had no idea that the Greenbrier was visited by so many famous people. As I said before, I've heard of it, but I didn't know a ton about it. But I just didn't realize it had been a vacation spot for all of those presidents and that different royal people had visited. I just had no idea it had that kind of guest list. Yes, it's crazy um, to look at it and see. But you totally feel it when you're walking around the campus there. They've retained so many of the original buildings. Back when the, when the resort was first started, it was a kind of a spring, like a healing, a healing um, place to come to take the sulfur water, which is not necessarily 100% unique to to the Greenbrier. I mean, there are other places that did that. But what was unique to the Greenbrier is that influential people started coming and building home, building cottages there. And then it kind of became a staple place, similar to Newport, but on a smaller scale, really, where people came to be seen and to influence and to be influenced. So many government, you know, the government ties to, to the Greenbrier run very deep. And if you know anything about the history of the Greenbrier, more 
a more modern history, I guess, in the 70s. They built the congressional bunker there as well. So the history of, I, I even believe that there's, there's things we don't even know, you know, re- with the government and the Greenbrier that it's been such a place for their respite for so long that it wouldn't surprise me if, if the history there is, is even deeper than the public is allowed to know. But it's a really cool place. And it's just a place that is storied and you can kind of just not in a creepy way, but you can just feel people, you know, one walking those grounds before you and, it's a comforting thing to know that something that is good has lasted that long. My friend Pam Lamp, who also read your book and really enjoyed it, was the one who told me about the Congressional Bunker. Like, I didn't know about that. And I guess it's no longer used for that. Maybe you can tour it now. Is that right? Yes, you can tour it. And it's very interesting. Uh, And, you know, that's one of the things that people always say, oh, that'd make a great novel, too. And I thought about that. But to be honest, you know, it was it was developed in secret. So people thought that the Greenbrier was kind of making a more like a, a bigger um, hall for, you know, business conferences and things like that. And that's kind of how they passed off the bunker to everyone. But then after that, only two people knew about it. And they were manning a desk under the guise of a cable service. Um, <laughs> so it would, it, as interesting as it could be, I thought to myself, well, only two people knew. So this story would have to be about two people. And who are they going to talk to? And what's the plot here? But it is such an interesting thing. And it's really cool to go down there and realize, you know, this was just sitting in plain sight. It is fascinating. It really did make me want to visit there even more than I already do. Yes, there's just so many things to see. Every time, every time you go, you find something different. And a lot of, in a large part, that's due to Dorothy Draper's design and Carlton Varney's continuation of that design. There's interesting little things everywhere. And every time you go, I mean, I've been, I don't even know how many times it's got to be in veering toward the hundreds now. But every time you go, you know, there's like a little, you see a little area you've never noticed before, or it's just, you know, there's, there's little bits of fascination everywhere there. And so I highly recommend going and visiting just because you'll be so entertained. There's just, it's a great place to be entertained, a great place to make memories. And you were just there recently, I think for some kind of conference and you recreated your cover, right? Yes, that was so much fun. I was actually there for the Dorothy Draper Decorating Weekend, which happens every year. And it's led by the Dorothy Draper team. And it was amazing. We got to tour the upholstery facilities that are constantly updating you know, the furniture and got to see. I actually wanted to, I asked um, one of the people there, I said, is it okay? Maybe I should just do a dumpster dive and just grab as much upholstery as I possibly can. Of course, I'm kidding. But it was just a wash with all of the fabrics and the amazing, just the furniture. Some of the furniture has been at the hotel and they've just been recovering it since she redecorated in the forties. So you can uh, imagine the quality that is, that is exhibited in the halls there. Then after that, we had just a great time learning from the Dorothy Draper team and the interior designers that work for them. They took us on a tour of the property and explained just how they do things. And we got to, got an inside peek at all of the cool suites of the Greenbrier, including the presidential suite, which is where my book cover is actually the presidential suite staircase. And the staircase was designed upon request for, uh, actually Dorothy Draper obviously designed it, but it was designed for um, the Duchess of Windsor when she came for the grand opening. But my book cover is right there in front of the stair staircase and I got to go and stand there and imagine that I was Dorothy for a minute. (laughs) Well, your cover is stunning, and I'd love to talk a little bit about the cover and your title. Yes. So the cover, um, I was just so excited about it. Harper Muse, my publisher, has just the most amazing designers. I was so excited to see what they came up with, and I'm just thrilled that they were able to use a picture from the actual Greenbrier. I think anyone that has been there is just going to see it and know exactly what it is and where and where that is. I think it is one of the most photographed spots. You know, it's just, it's pretty unmistakable. But then, yes, we actually had a title change. My title was called the Greenbrier Resort. And we recently changed it to the Grand Design. And that was just simply because the Greenbrier Resort is a trademark. And so, the Greenbrier loved the book, but just asked that we change the title just to eliminate any confusion that would could potentially happen upon, um, you know, using that trademark name. Plus, it'll probably be easier for people to find it if they're searching the Grand Design versus the Greenbrier Resort. Absolutely. Well, before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. So many books, so many great ones out right now. 
well, these two, one is, has just released, um, and one is forthcoming. Actually, two have just released and one is forth, forthcoming. Erica Roebuck's latest, Sisters of Night and Fog, is remarkable. Everything she writes is gold. I tell her that all the time. She's just magnificent. I highly recommend it. And also the Mozart Code by Rachel McMillan. It was just so interesting. You know, it's, it's set in Prague and Vienna. And it was just such an interesting take on, you know, how music and how music is so steeped in that culture and then kind of plays into everything there, including the aftermath of World War II, which is where, it, when it takes place. And then also forthcoming, coming up is The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare by Kimberly Brock. I loved it so much. It's, it's set on the, uh, at, right after, well, actually in the midst of World War II. And it's about the Eleanor Dare heirs, the heirs of Eleanor Dare of the Lost Colony and supposes that, you know, these women have been kind of passed a gift down from Eleanor through the generations. And it takes them to a family homestead near Savannah and just the atmosphere. She paints such a beautiful picture of that area of, of the country. And it's just great to sink into that. It's, it's like a vacation, to be honest. So I definitely would check out those three books. They've been the books I've been recommending the most these days. And Kimberly's book also has a stunning cover. And by the time this episode runs, I will have already interviewed her and that episode will have run. So that timing is good. Good. So, well, thank you so much, Joy. It was really fun to speak with you about the grand design, and I'm so glad you came on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much, Cindy. I've loved talking to you today. My name's Adam Sokol, and I'm the host of the Passions and Prologues podcast. Every week, best-selling authors like Jenny Jackson, Rebecca Mackay, Lisa Scottolini, or Brad Meltzer come on to my show to talk about, yes, their new books, but more importantly, the things that they're crazy passionate about. We've talked about the Muppets, powerlifting, traveling, gardening, home improvement, and so much more. We dig into why these things are their passions, how they inspire their writing, and where they came to fall in love with these random assorted things. Be sure to subscribe to the Passions and Prologues podcast wherever you get your podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com to learn more. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.